Occupational English test, listening test. This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions one to twenty-four, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract one. Extract one, questions one to twelve. For questions one to twelve, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes. Hi, Hannah. Nice to meet you. Hi. <laughs> so I understand that you were referred to me by your GP because you've been experiencing some anxiety difficulties. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess it kind of started like five, six years ago. OK. Um, it kind of it escalated a bit. Um, I've just recently moved out um, from living with my parents, so it's made it a bit worse, I think. Okay, is this the first time that you've left home? Uh, yeah, I um, yeah, it's the first time actually. Yeah, um, I was going to a few years ago. I just thought it'd be easier to stay home. So, <laughs> okay, so it's been quite a big step and a big change, and mm. and it sounds like that. So that was what led you to go to your GP. Yeah. So how has that uh, changed things for you? Um, do you know it's kind of I haven't really told anyone. So I mean, it's made it. Like better in the sense that I feel hopefully this is you know, this is it like it will it'll help but I don't know I don't like thinking that I've ha like had to do this I never thought I'd like be the kind of person who'd have to actually go and like get help if that makes sense. Okay so how do you feel about being here today? Um, a bit like scared I don't know hopefully it will help. Okay so but... you'll be feeling a little bit anxious about today? Yeah. Okay, so I guess just going back to um, why you went to the GP and, and how you've ended up kind of coming here today. So it sounds like you've been experiencing anxiety for quite a few years, yeah. um, but just recently you moved out of home for the first time, mm. and um, and that was what kind of led you to go to the GP. So how did that change things? How were things after you moved out? Um, I thought that they'd be better, but because I thought I'd have to kind of be independent, and but it's actually a lot worse. I'm I'm just kind of staying in the house a lot. I don't really have any friends or anything. I mean, my family come and visit a bit, but it's not, I don't know, it's kind of scary because I've just been kind of literally just in the flat by myself, which I always thought I'd like, but I don't actually like it. Okay. So what are the kind of difficulties that you have been experiencing? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a photographer, um, so I kind of, it's, it's been stopping me a bit, my anxiety, from being able to get work and because every time, you know, there's a, an opportunity that is kind of involving me having to interact with people, I just tend to just turn it down. So I was kind of making things hard in that respect and um, just kind of friends-wise and everything, I just feel like I'm just kind of increasingly more alone. So mm -hmm. it's kind of stopping me from making friends and, you know like relationships and stuff. <laughs> okay, so you said that um, your difficulties are getting in the way of you doing certain things, so they're, they're stopping you from taking up kind of certain types of work. And as yeah. a freelance photographer, I guess that, that can be kind of a, a problem. Yeah. And they're also stopping you, or you feel like it's stunting you uh, socially. Mm -hmm. You're not kind of able to make new friends and get to meet new people. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, it was kind of easier when I was at home because I was obviously, I mean, my parents and stuff, that's fine, but, you know, they would, I'd go to places with them or I'd kind of have people there, but more and more I'm just finding myself just staying in a lot. I mean, I went like two weeks ago for coffee with my friends and the whole time I was just kind of wanting to go home again. So I don't, I just don't want to, I don't want that to happen. I don't want to lose everyone. Mm -hmm. So So you're kind of worried about where this is going to lead to. Yeah. Um, Yeah. (laughs) So you said that you first noticed the anxiety kicking in about five, six years ago. So you would have been about 19. Yeah. And what was happening around that time? Uh, I guess I'd finished school about a year before that. Um, And I mean, I've always been a bit shy. Um, at school but it was never ever uh, like it didn't really affect things as much as not at all as much as it has been doing the last few years Mm -hmm. I guess it just started when it like my friends went to university and I don't know I felt like I was expected to kind of move out or do something and then it just kind of escalated from there I'd, I'd just stop going to parties or I'd just say no to invitations or I don't know I thought my job would help because I mean I love it I, I really like doing photography but I'm just kind of getting less and less work as it goes on mm-hmm. so which is my fault I keep saying no <laughs> but what kind of work is the most difficult for you in um, your job I guess when it I have to kind of be working with other people um I don't like that I'd, it's like when I'm trying to kind of do an event or something where there's a lot of people there not just photographers but actual you know if I'm like taking photos of people Mm -hmm. that I don't know I just kind of find myself saying no I mean I want to do them but just it's scary so I just Mm -hmm. don't do it so I guess tell me a bit more about what happens then so let's focus on maybe an invitation to do a job with uh you know it's going to involve uh, photography with with a group of people and you're going to have to have social interaction. What kind of thoughts go through your head? Um, just, I mean, I get really hot and sweaty and I don't, I feel like everyone's kind of looking at me and thinking that I'm just like really stupid and I feel like they're all going to be staring and thinking I just can't do my job and I'm just an idiot and I mean, they'll think that I just look like a weirdo and I just try and, I mean, I just kind of just try and get out of the situation or just focus on something else. So that's why I like doing shots where it's just me and the camera, because then I can just put all my attention on that instead of having to, you know, be with other people. Okay, so it sounds like you have quite a lot of thoughts rushing through your head then at Mm. the point where you get that invitation and you think... People look, people stare, people will think I'm a weirdo. Yeah. So there's quite a lot about what you, th- what you think other people will think. Yeah. Um, and how does that make you feel? Um, it just makes me feel like an idiot. It makes me feel like I just shouldn't even bother trying to do it anymore. I should just go home and I just... I think I just don't want to be in that situation. I just feel like everyone else is fine and they're normal and I'm just the freak who can't, like, do normal things and... Okay. Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. I'm feeling very stressed out lately, a lot of tension. Can you tell me more about that? I just feel like nothing I do is good enough. I work really hard, I try really hard, but I'm still having a really hard time. So what I hear you saying is that you're feeling really stressed and kind of stretched out too thin? I am stretched too thin. I'm trying so hard, but I can't live up to my dad's expectations. 
I really love him, but it doesn't feel right or what it should be like. My friend's parents support them. And what do you wish things would be like? I'd like to have more free time. I have lots of friends, and they get to relax and hang out after school, and I don't get to do any of those things. I like to do that or spend time with my boyfriend. My dad has always pushed sports. If it's not volleyball, it's another sport, and I just want to make him happy. That sounds exhausting. So it sounds like you're feeling this contradiction of pleasing your dad and meeting his expectations, but you also want to enjoy yourself and be young. Is that right? Yeah. So that must be really frightening to be so confused about your dad's expectations, and I also imagine you feel pretty frustrated with him. Yeah, I am frustrated with him. If I don't please him, it makes me feel like I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. What do you think your dad wants you to be like? Well, he wants me to be in really good shape, make the best of grades, graduate with honors so I can get into a really great school, and I know he just wants the best for me, and I want to make him happy. Oh, I can really hear you really love your dad, don't you? Yeah, which is why not living up to his standards is so hard. And so it's this feeling that only a part of you is acceptable. And that doesn't leave much room for you to be human, does it? No, it's like he wants me to be perfect. Perfect like those women in the magazines. Yeah. And if his love for you is based on a picture, um, what's the good of that? You're right. It is no good. I can't ever be good enough for him. I can't ever live up to his expectations. And we have this college visit coming up. I feel like college is too far away. It's too far into the future. I feel like it's too much pressure, and I'm not even sure if that's where I want to go to school. I could visit at any point, but it's this weekend. My boyfriend was going to take me to a concert that all my friends are going to. I want to enjoy my life, not worry about the future. My dad said we had to go now, even though he knows about the concert this weekend. What should I do? It's not where I want to go anyway, but I can't tell my dad. I can never tell him that's not where I want to go. I want to be a kid. I want to enjoy my life. I just don't think it's fair. Why do I always have to live up to what he wants me to do? What should I do? Should I tell my dad I don't want to go? And so this is the conflict. It's, it's really hard for me because I want to give you an answer, and I really wish that I could give you the answer you want. I really mean that. But that's why I'm going to therapy. I thought you were supposed to tell me what to do. Well, I don't mean to be evasive about this, but I just I want to know what do you think you should do in this situation? I don't know. Why can't I just be like a normal person and tell him I don't want to go? Why do I tell him things I really don't mean? Mm -hmm. And so I catch that the real deep puzzle is you feel this, what should I do? Sometimes it's sad for me to notice how hard you are on yourself about yourself. And I really appreciate you sharing this with me. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm hard on myself because I need to be. But I hate how I always have to live up to such high standards. Mm -hmm. And so the thing that comes to mind is me asking, what do you wish I would say to you? I wish you would tell me what to do. I feel like there's a part of me that really wants to please my dad, but in order to please him, I don't feel like I can be myself. <sighs> there's just a part of me that feels lost and unsure of myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really hear that. And to me, at the same time, you don't sound too uncertain. Oh, really? Yeah, judging by the tone of your voice, it sounds like the thought of doing what your dad wants you to do is more uncomfortable than it is for you to actually tell him how you feel. I just wish he would listen, that he wanted to know how I feel. He just wants me to be the perfect daughter, but he doesn't even know the real me. And so you sort of feel this, I want my dad to like me for who I am. Yeah, I'm not the straight A, size zero, perfect girl. And I can never be good enough. I can never be smart enough or skinny enough. And what I think I'm hearing you say is that you'd like to feel accepted for your dad. Yeah, that's what I want. How can I do that? Do you think I should say something to him? Well, I feel like this is a really private thing that I couldn't answer for you. Um, but I'll definitely try to help you come to your own answer. It doesn't matter how much I want him to accept me. 
He wouldn't like the real me. I could never live up to his expectations. The thought of even saying anything is terrifying because I know he would be so disappointed. Would it even be worth it to say something to him? I'm really not sure. It's an awfully risky thing to live, and you'd be taking a chance with your relationship with him, and you'd also be taking a chance with yourself. Yeah, it really is risky. I'm never in control of anything. Sometimes I feel like the only thing I have control over is food. That sounds really upsetting. I think what I'm hearing you say is that by controlling food is the only way that you feel that you can make a choice for yourself. Even just talking about it right now is making me really tense because it's making me think of everything I ate today. Counting the calories is one of the only things that makes me feel better because it's something I can control. So you're feeling anxious at the moment and like your only relief is in controlling what you eat. I guess that's the only thing my dad can't control. That it's just mine. I don't think that's right. I wish I didn't have to be so hard on myself and I could eat like everybody else does. So it's quite clear that the problem isn't just with your dad or your relationship with him, but it's also in you as well. And um, in this question of how can I accept myself? That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. Now read the question. Okay, your order sheet is in your chart. It's under the uh, tab that's labeled Physician's Orders. You're going to check these orders against your paper MAR. There's two pages to your paper MAR, your routine medicines and your PRN medicines. So first check your patient's name, Sally Gunter, Sally Gunter. Okay, then check for the date of birth, 5-8-41, 5-8-41. The next thing you want to look at is allergies. Sally is allergic to penicillin. Your allergy is penicillin. And you want to go down and you want to verify every medicine that they have. So on the orders, it's potassium chloride, 40 milli equivalents, PO, three times a day. Potassium chloride, oral, liquid, 40 milli equivalents, PO, three times a day. K-Flex, 250 milligrams, PO, every six hours. K-Flex, 250 milligrams, PO, every six hours. Norvas, 5 milligrams, PO, twice a day. Norvas, 5 milligrams, PO, twice a day. Prilosec, 20 milligrams, PO daily. Prilosec, 20 milligrams, PO daily. When you're looking at your physician's order, make sure it has a date, a time, and a physician's signature. Sally Gunter also has a PRN order of clonidine. 0.1 milligram tablet every six hours. PRN for a diastolic blood pressure greater than 90. Clonidine. 0.1 milligram tablet, PO every six hours, PRN for diastolic blood pressure greater than 90. Now all your um, routine meds and your PRN meds are checked against your physician's order sheet. The next thing you want to do is to look here. Number one is compare your order sheet to your MAR and then your initial when once verified. So you would sign your initials that you verified these medicines. Question 26. Now read the question. Let's examine this. 
if I had the fearful thought that I could ultimately lose everything, then it's not going to move me forward. It's not going to help me think clearly. It's not going to help me, you know, move forward and take take the actions that I need to take. It can kind of limit me and make me feel like I don't want to do anything because I'm scared to do anything. But what I have found, and this is what I do all the time, is when I'm having a fearful thought, I know that I can't not think about something. Because the more you try to not think about something, the more you're just going to think about it. So you have to replace that thought. And what I replace that thought with is, how can I use this fearful thought or use this fearful event to make me a better person, a better nurse, and to learn from this experience? I'm happy to share this with you so that you can, you know, hopefully learn from my mistakes. Um, so what happened was I realized that I made the mistake, and not only had I made the mistake once, I had actually did it. I had actually done it the first time I administered the medication as well. So I thought about it, and I was like, okay. Well, of course, I have to do an incident report with the mistake. I'm going to show her that I can, you know, not only take care of the situation and have her trust me with her patients, but she can also see that I'm a very confident person and that this mistake won't happen again. So I went to her and I said, you know, I told her the mistake, you know, ultimately told her what happened and, you know, it was a mistake and we examined it and, you know, she asked me a few questions and it was an uncomfortable situation, but what I realized was that I came out of that as well as I possibly could have. Having the lack of confidence, you can replace that with, no matter what happens, I will build from this and I will learn from this and I will ultimately become a better person. So guys, it's all about replacing those fearful thoughts with thoughts that are going to serve you. Question 27. Now read the question. I was actually talking about culture-bound phenomena and I had a professor of, of psychology say to me that there's no evidence that culture-bound or cultural illness exists. And I actually said to him, my response to him was that you're absolutely correct. And people were quite surprised when I said you're absolutely correct in the world in which you live. So you actually can't necessarily blame someone if they've never actually been exposed to it before. So the important point is, is that if you actually don't have it in a framework that, that most people, and, and what I'm talking about is mainstream, can relate to, in that it's actually researched and it's written up in a scientific journal, then they're actually forced to relate to it or at least open their you know, um, mindset up to a different reality. Question 28. Now read the question. Hello, I'm Jan Machescu. I called this morning. Yes, Mr. Machescu, your prescriptions are right here. They've been ready for an hour. Good. Now, take these pills three times a day. That's every eight hours. I usually take them at seven in the morning, three in the afternoon, and one before I go to bed about 10 or 11 at night. That's fine. When do I take the other pills? You can take these any time you feel a pain. Well, it's almost lunchtime. Is it okay if I take one before lunch? It's better if you wait until after lunch, after you've eaten. Well, why is that? The pills may upset your stomach if it's empty. Oh, okay. I'll wait till after lunch. I'll take one about 1 o'clock this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks very much for your help. You're welcome. Question 29. Now read the question.
Right, I'd like to tell you about all the patients on this ward, starting with bed one. John Smith is a 45-year-old male who had a motorbike accident on his way home from work. He was admitted to the ED at 2300 hours on the 1st of August with a frontal lobe contusion. Sorry, I don't know that word contusion. Could you please explain? Sure, in this case it means a concussion. Thank you. He has breaks in his right arm and hand and has had surgery including metal plates inserted into his arm. He also has deep grazes on his left knee and ankle and stitches in his right hip and shoulder. Stitches in the right hip and shoulder? Yes, that's right. All dressings have been changed this morning uh, at 900 hours. He's on a self-administered morphine drip and he's also on an antibiotic drip. Um, he has had injections to prevent blood clotting and his pain is quite manageable with the medication he's on. Question 30. Now read the question. I worked with this man called Graham, that wasn't his real name. He started to hear voices, he had strong paranoid beliefs that people were talking about him. He had to come into hospital and the main way of actually helping overcome that loneliness and isolation as a result of his experiences was to really enter his world, to develop a shared model, a shared understanding of how these experiences um, shaped his beliefs and how that made him feel both emotionally and how he reacted behaviourally by avoiding a whole range of situations. It makes me feel really good actually and it gives me a tremendous source of satisfaction that actually by relating to somebody, by understanding somebody, that you can actually empower them and help them recover. Without the benefits of professional help, Graham would still be stuck at home. He would still be experiencing rather distressing voices. That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, Choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Tell me a little bit about, about the progress in the plant-based movement recently. 
there's been tremendous progress, particularly in the health field. At least that's, I mean, that's certainly my perspective. Um, so in the states, there's just been a a real surge, a real tipping point in terms of the plant-based uh, nutrition movement. There are now entire conferences. There's an international plant-based nutrition healthcare conference. Hundreds of physicians, other medical professionals get together, talk about how they're using this in their practice. I mean, that didn't exist a few years ago. I mean, it's really, really exciting. There's new vegan medical clinics opening up where all the folks on staff are using lifestyle medicine approaches, not just to prevent disease, but to stop and reverse it as well. Mm, tell me about the main players involved. You've got nutrition facts growing, you've got the Physicians Committee doing a lot of work. Um, who are the main players and what's been achieved specifically in the last few months and last year? What's been the memorable moment for you? Well, so, you know, a lot of people don't know about Scott Stoll, who started this, uh, the uh, um, PBNHC, this, uh, this plantrition project, this um, uh, plant-based nutrition conference. He's been doing these immersion programs for Whole Foods for a long time now. Um, he has a book coming out. Okay. I'm very excited about that. Um, he's just had transformative experiences. You know, he's just a physician in practice. There's people all over who've been doing this in their own little, you know, hometowns. But it's just great to get so many people together, start networking. Um, uh, so there's wonderful resources out now, documentaries. You know, we got a number of documentaries coming up, like The Game Changers and uh, Eat Yourself Alive. And I mean, it's just this is an exciting mm -hmm. time to be in the movement. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of it is just there's so much, uh, I mean, we're going to get there if only because the health care costs are spiraling out of control, right? Uh, climate change. I mean, we're just going to be forced to have to take these, you know, safe, simple, side effect free solutions, cheaper, safer, more effective than conventional medical approaches, because we're talking about the leading killers, right? The leading cause of death. I mean, the good news is, is that the vast majority of premature death and disability is preventable with a plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle behaviors. We have the power, we have tremendous power over our medical destiny and longevity. You talk passionately about the benefits of uh, plant-based diet, particularly reversing heart disease. My old boss, he was a professor of epidemiology called Professor Tim Spector. He said mm. he met Dr. Dean Ornish. Mm. Dr. Dean Ornish said, the thing with the plant-based movement is you get the sense you're either with them or against them. We're going to talk mm. about that in a minute. But also what he said was there aren't any uh, large randomized control trials. He said, Dr. Dean Ornish, show me the large randomized... Why aren't there any? If we've known about this since Pritikin's day, where's the data, the large randomized control trials? Well, look, I mean, Ornish published uh, his first RCT, randomized control trial, July 1990 in The Lancet, the most prestigious medical journal in the world. There it was, black and white, proving with quantitative angiography that we can reverse heart disease, open up arteries without drugs, without surgery, just a healthy plant-based diet and other lifestyle changes. There it was. Right? So we've known about it for decades, but there was published in some of the most prestigious medical journals in the world, The Lancet, JAMA, yet what happened? Nothing. Hundreds of thousands of people continue to die of a reversible, preventable disease. So it's being ignored. It's being lost down the rabbit hole and ignored. I said, well, wait a second. If the, effectively the cure to our number one killer could get lost like then, what else is there in the medical literature that could help my patients but just didn't have a corporate budget driving its promotion? I made it my life's mission to find out. That's why I started NutritionFacts.org, and that's why I wrote my new book, How Not to Die. What I find very interesting is you say the system needs to take on board this message, but the whole point of Nutrition Facts was to go around the system. Tell me a little about, bit about the democratization of information and the role that's played and why that's been good for the the movement, I guess. You know, I, when I started out, I started out ignoring the general public and going straight, you know, to, trying to train the trainers effectively, going around speaking at all the medical schools in the States to uh, try to, you know, get the next generation of doctors educated. But then I realized that's a slow way about it. We don't have time. People are dying now. I don't need to, you know, for another 10 years for them to kind of slowly take over the uh, medical system. People are dying now. We need to take this directly to the people. And thankfully, thanks to the internet age, we have now have this democratization of information. Now everyone has access. Before, the doctors had a monopoly 
on information about health. And so, big pharma, the food industry, all they had to do was get to the doctors. The tobacco industry, as long as they could get the AMA on board by writing them checks for $10 million, and so they came out opposed to the Surgeon General's report against smoking in 1964, as long as, they get, as long as they control the doctors, they control the health message. No longer. Now, people can get to the science directly, educate themselves, and, 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 and we can't wait until society catches up to the science because it's a matter of life and death. USDA, um, I've read their mission is to expand markets for agricultural products. But at the same time, they're coming out with the dietary guidelines. Is that one of the challenges you have in the States? The USDA has an inherent conflict of interest. The U.S. Department of Agriculture, look, the same thing happened here in Great Britain. Right there was the Ministry of Food and Forestry, right? And then the, the mad cow debacle came, mm -hmm. and they basically dissolved the department, right? Put, pu put you know, food safety in charge of, you know, medical professionals in charge of food safety instead of agriculture professionals. Same conflict of interest exists in the States. U.S. Department of Agriculture has this dual mission to promote agricultural products. That's what they're there for. But also, we put them in charge of food safety, meat inspections, come, helping to come up with the nutrition guidelines. So when it comes to eat more messaging, the message is clear. Eat more fruits and vegetables. There it is, right there in black and white in the dietary guidelines. But what about eat less messaging. Then there's a conflict. So what do you get? Instead of eat less meat, eggs, dairy, junk, what do they say? Eat less saturated and trans fatty acids, things like that. Biochemical components, right? Because they don't want to mention foods because that's too politically unpalatable. But they'll mention vegetables, they'll mention fruits. Well, they'll mention fruits and vegetables because it's an eat more messaging. Yeah. Everybody's happy. Promote agricultural products and promote health. If they can do it without uh, undermining the profit motive, they'd be happy to make the American public healthier. Can you just explain a little bit about um, how corrupt the medical industry is uh, in the US? It's kind of related to what you've talked about already. Well, there's a number of barriers for doctors. So you say, okay, we understand why some of the mainstream medical associations are sucking up to industry because they're being sponsored by Big Pharma, for example. But why aren't individual doctors speaking out? Well, there's a severe nutrition deficiency in doctors in education. We just weren't taught this in medical school, so we graduate without these powerful tools in our medical toolbox. We just weren't, we just weren't taught how to teach people to take better care of themselves. Right? Um, uh, but of course, there's other barriers. There's lack of time, lack of reimbursement. Doctors aren't paid um, to tell uh, people how to take better care of themselves. Um, and also, there's, um, there's you know, much of medical education, both uh, during medical school and postgraduate medical education, is paid for by the drug industry. I mean, the number one reason people go to their doctor in North America is what are called blood pressure checks. And they keep going to get their blood pressure checks so they can tweak the blood pressure medications. And so that's a boon, not only to Big Pharma, which sell these chronic disease drugs that people take every single day for the rest of their lives because they're not actually treating the cause of their disease, right? Because they're not actually changing their diet. So they need to be treated every day for the rest of their lives. So it's the boon to the Big Pharma, but also that's where the doctor's getting their next BMW from and sending their kids to college. I mean, the, the most common, it's the bread and butter of the GPs, of the, of the primary care docs, is these blood pressure checks, which wouldn't be necessary if they didn't have high blood pressure. The number one killer risk factor in the world, nine million people dying of high blood pressure, a disease that need not occur if people, a plant-based diet, something we've known since the 1920s. Now look at extract 2. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42.
We've been studying a disorder called seasonal affective disorder. Norman Rosenthal first identified this disorder in the mid 80s. The theory is that a decrease in light during the long winter months may be responsible for triggering a chemical imbalance that, in turn, may cause depression among those people with a predisposition to depression. Supposedly, there's an area of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is very close to the retina of the eye. So this area of the brain responds to light by sending a signal to the pineal gland, and the signal causes the gland to suppress a secretion of a hormone called melatonin. To make a long story short, the more light, the less melatonin in the blood. Okay, the acronym for seasonal affective disorder that's being used in the field is SAD. We didn't come up with that, and in fact, I personally think that it's an inappropriate way to refer to such a serious type of depression, since it sounds rather mild. And seasonal affective disorder can be a very severe and debilitating disorder for some people. In fact, in extreme cases, it's life-threatening when patients become suicidal. So anyway. As you can appreciate, the winter here is very dark, cold, and gray. By spring, almost everyone's tired of the gloom. But for some people, those suffering with seasonal affective disorder, it can be a serious problem. People with seasonal affective disorder experience deep and prolonged depression throughout the winter months, with what looks like a spontaneous alleviation of the condition when spring arrives. Before the disorder was identified, it was rather a mystery for friends and family, since the depression appeared to vanish only to return several months later. Now, although previous research isn't conclusive, we do know that younger people, especially younger women, these women are at a higher risk for developing the disorder and for being affected by it in a more severe form. If I recall, about seventy-five percent of those affected are women. With a typical age of onset about thirty years old, other factors that contribute to the problem, apart from the long dark days, of course, these factors include heredity and stress. What are the symptoms? Well, the usual spectrum of problems associated with depression: anxiety, lack of concentration, a tendency to sleep more and eat more, cravings for food with a high sugar content. This may be accompanied by weight gain. On the other hand, some people actually lose their appetites and tend to lose a significant amount of weight. We also see lower energy levels, and for some people, a dull headache may accompany the problem. So, building on the research studies that identified the symptoms of seasonal affective disorder and the high risk profile, we decided to undertake a longitudinal study of 120 subjects. And our research is really focusing on therapies that might help those people affected by SAD. Traditionally, psychotherapy has been used to identify and modify behaviors that contribute to depression, and it's been somewhat successful with patients identified with seasonal affective disorder, especially when used in combination with relaxation and stress reduction therapies. Antidepressant drug therapy has also been proven to reduce depression in studies of people who had seasonal disorders, but we've been using phototherapy almost exclusively with the subjects in our studies. It's very simple, really. We've supplied each subject with a light box that provides the same type of natural lighting that would normally be shining through the window during the spring and summer. The subjects have been instructed to turn on the light box for two hours. And then simply go about their activities in the room where the box is placed. They're not supposed to use the box like a sun lamp. No staring into the light, either with the eyes closed or open. They just ignore it once it's turned on. So, although we're still evaluating our data from the first group of subjects, we have a few preliminary findings that I'll share with you today. First, we think that it's probably better to be exposed to the light box during the morning hours. Second, we're noticing a relationship between sleep patterns and seasonal depression, so maintaining a regular schedule for sleep seems to be a helpful therapy in conjunction with the light treatment. We're also fairly sure that the duration of light therapy can be modified for individuals. Some subjects who were exposed to the light for less than two hours did very well, while others showed no evidence of relief until they re-established the two-hour treatments. 
One interesting possibility that we're working on is whether fluorescent lights might work as well as full spectrum light with the ultraviolet rays filtered out. In our first trials, we used UV light exclusively, but now we have some trials underway with fluorescent light, and the results so far are encouraging. I'm also happy to report that there are few subjects who are experiencing side effects. There's no evidence of eye damage. We've been careful to filter out any potentially damaging UV rays. And in fact, the only negative side effect was minor headache that seemed to disappear after a few treatments. So, next semester, we plan to begin the second stage of our studies, and we'll be comparing the degree of depression on the part of subjects undergoing light treatments. With control groups who receive either drug treatments or psychotherapy, what we really want to know is whether light treatments alone are as effective as the other options for therapy. That is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.